Hey there, and welcome to Muscle for Life. I am Mike Matthews. Thank you for joining me today for an interview on how to make better and cheaper meal plans, a topic that I'm always getting asked about and I will always get asked about. How do I make better meal plans? And I brought on one of Legion's athletes, Zach Cohn, to share some of his favorite tips for making delicious meals and making healthy foods taste better and making them easier to prepare and saving money on them. And in case you are not familiar with Zach, he is a registered dietitian and nutritionist who shares recipes and educational nutrition content and meal planning tips on social media. He has a big and growing following over on TikTok and Instagram. And his content is mostly about how to incorporate foods you actually like into your meal plans and how to make food planning and prepping simple and fun so you can stay on track and make progress without breaking the bank or breaking your palate. (laughs) And in this chat, Zach and I talk about practical tips for snacking and how to incorporate more vegetables into your diet in an enjoyable way. We talk about making your own versions of certain store-bought items and pre-prepared foods. Uh, Zach shares some crafty shopping tips to save money. He talks about crock pot cooking, which is something he's really big on these days, fitness-friendly desserts, and what to avoid, and more. Before we get into it, if you like what I'm doing here on the podcast and want 125 of my favorite quick, easy, and delicious fitness-friendly recipes, you want to get a copy of my flexible dieting cookbook, The Shredded Chef. Because here's the deal, you don't need to follow a bland, boring bodybuilder diet to get into the best shape of your life. You can eat delicious home-cooked meals you love without living in the kitchen, struggling with hard to prepare recipes or overspending on expensive ingredients. And The Shredded Chef is the shortcut because it has 13 delicious and easy to make breakfast recipes like BLT Eggs Benedict, Huevos Rancheros, high protein banana oat cakes, and more. It has 11 mouth-watering salads and dressings like a spicy Santa Fe taco salad, grilled Mediterranean salad with sun-dried tomato vinaigrette, creamy jalapeno cilantro dressing and more. It also has 14 low calorie snacks that you'll actually want to eat like blueberry coconut pancake batter smoothie, maple walnut protein muffins, peanut butter protein swirl brownies and more. There are also 16 succulent beef and pork recipes for savory lunches and dinners like beef stroganoff, one of my personal favorites, beef lo mein, parmesan crusted pork chops and more. And then there are 18 tasty poultry dishes that you will love again and again, like curry chicken, Mexican meatloaf, which is killer, polo fajitas, and more. There are eight flavorful seafood recipes, like creamy fettuccine with scallops, graham cracker crusted tilapia, seared cod with no-cook mustard caper sauce, and more. There are 11 appetizing side dishes, like crispy squash fries. Squash fries are so good. If you've never had them before, you're in for a treat. Sweet potato chips, roasted garlic, twice-baked potato, and more. And finally, there are 10 delectable and macro-friendly desserts that you can enjoy guilt-free, like peach cobbler, maple raisin bread pudding, triple berry crisp, and more. I also give, for all of those recipes, cook time, prep time, servings, calories, protein, carbs, and fat, which makes meal planning a breeze. And I even went further and put all of that information into a spreadsheet, which makes it even easier to build out your meal plan. And you can get that as a free download when you get the book, part of the free bonus material. And so all of that is why The Shredded Chef has sold well over 300,000 copies, has received over 3,300 four and five star reviews on Amazon, and has helped that I know of thousands of people build their best body ever. And you can find it on all major online retailers, wherever you like to buy books, Amazon, iTunes, Kobo, Google Play, BN.com, even Audible, there is an audiobook. And yes, some people do buy cookbooks as audiobooks. Who knew? And you can also find The Shredded Chef in select Barnes & Noble stores. Hey, Zach, thanks for taking the time to come and talk to me. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. So 
But we are here to talk about meal planning. And as I was just saying offline, most people listening, they know the basics of, of good meal planning. They know how to set up their calories. They know that um, you need to eat enough protein. They know that most people, they tend to do better on higher carb rather than lower carb as far as uh, satiety goes. And they know to drink water and eat fruits and vegetables and so forth. But I wanted to talk to you to get tactical with meal planning and to get just some some practical tips that people can use to make meal plans that are easier to follow, that are more enjoyable. Like, for example, we can just start with something that people ask me about, which is they'll ask me, I'm not a big snacker, so I actually don't have great personal. I can share general advice, but I don't have great personal advice. But I'll get asked for good, low calorie, kind of higher protein meal prep ideas, you know, like stuff that you're going to eat in between your bigger meals that is satisfying, um, that is maybe a little bit more interesting than just like a pot of yogurt or something, which is maybe what I would do personally because I'm boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, dairy is, is a big, a big snack for me. There's a lot of misinformation around dairy right now. Um, I mean, but that's with every food nowadays. If you just combined like uh, three or four different ideologies, you actually can't eat anything. Like that's it. Yeah, you can exactly. you can breathe air and maybe yep. drink water. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, even even those now. There's like these uh, these guys that claim that the water we drink is is killing us. It's all right. Good. So throw water out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or it needs to be special ionized alkaline. Yeah. Water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For and sure. then and then it probably needs to be um maybe ionized air as well. Yeah. And and of course the water they want to want us to drink is ten times the cost. So well, yeah, naturally, but you know, you, yeah. you have to pay for quality. You, you get what you pay yeah, for. Yeah. But uh yeah, I I really like um uh dairy snacks. Um but my whole approach is the best diet is one that you can adhere to. So if you're trying to fill those those snack gaps in with things like veggie straws and you absolutely hate veggie straws, veggie straws are going to be about the same amount of calories as a serving of Doritos. So if you really like Doritos, then make them fit into your into your goals, you know. So it really just comes down to adherence. But I, I'm, I'm a big advocate for uh, making your own protein bars. I love like homemade granola bars. They're super easy. You know, throw a few ingredients in a bowl, mix them together. You can freeze them, eat them in the future. What's your go-to recipe these days? So I'm, I'm big into anything with oat flour now, just blending, blending the oats and almost making like, uh, they're like baked oats, but you can put them out in a sheet pan and make, cut them into bars and just eat them like that. So it's basically like baked oats, but cut them into bars, wrap them up and, you know, eat them on the go. And so are you, you're cooking the, the oatmeal first or these are just the uncooked oats? So you put the oats in a blender. So basically the way you would make baked oats, you know, usually blend the oats together with um, an egg, a little bit of Greek yogurt, a mm -hmm. couple scoops of protein, blend it up, make it smooth. And then you would typically pour it into like a, a microwave safe mug or a ramekin and bake it like that and eat it. So you can actually pour them into like a baking sheet or a baking tray. Make a bigger batch, of course, yeah. pour them in there. And then once they come out, it's almost like a big sheet cake. And then you can cut those into bars and eat them on the go. Yeah, I used to do baked oatmeal. I, I don't know, probably for maybe a year straight. I was just rotating through different. Do you would, burn out on it? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't burn out easily on food, but eventually I just don't look forward to it anymore. And I'm like, yeah, all right, now yeah. it's time to change it. Like, sure, I can continue to eat it, but why when I can, you know, and something else now, it just, just seems more appealing, but it takes a lot. It takes, it took yeah, probably yeah, a year, sure. but you know, a nice thing about oatmeal is, um, especially when you do it, do the, the whole baked, uh, in, oh, I don't even know the term, I guess it was not a Dutch oven, but whatever, a baking pan of sorts. And I would try different fruits. I would try, you know, sometimes use milk, sometimes use milk substitutes, try different spices. And so I, I rotated through a lot of different variations. Yeah, it's really versatile. I mean, you can make it however you like, whatever flavors you like. Yeah, it's quite good, especially with the right fruits. For me, it, it felt like a dessert, but it was also a way to get in a couple servings of whole grains and and fruit as well. Yeah, for sure. As far as as uh, dairy products go, what 
are you are, are you uh, standard Greek yogurt or? Yeah, I really like uh, Greek yogurt. I love the Chobani flips. Um, okay. They're a little higher calorie, less protein than, you know, your typical tub of, of Greek yogurt. But they're a lot more enjoyable, in, in my opinion. But I mean, you can make those yourself, too, you know, with just a little bit of standard Greek yogurt. A lot of the stuff that they incorporate in those Chobanis, you can you can find in the baking aisle, like crumbled uh, Heath bars, crumbled up Butterfinger, mini m and stuff like that. And you can throw a little bit in there, you know, make it more enjoyable, make it more fun. But yeah, Greek yogurt. Um, I really like uh, cheese, string cheese, like the lower calorie, low fat um, cheeses. The pre-made uh, protein shakes. I really like the uh, the Fairlife Nutrition Plan shakes. Um, you got Premier Protein. I really like, obviously, the Legion stuff. I, wa- I want to do RTDs. We're just not there yet. <laughs> oh, man, that would be amazing. I know, I know. It'll happen. It's just... It's uh, it's one of those things that it sounds so simple. Like, why don't you just do RTDs, dude? What's wrong with you? Yeah. Uh, but the logistics are are a bit more obnoxious than than most people ri- realize. It'll happen. But what happens with with building a business, especially a bootstrapped business? So, you know, I, I haven't had any investors, and so you just have to pick and choose. You only have so much money, and then also just execution bandwidth. And so, you know, y- you're always trying to go after kind of the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak. And RTDs are just a little bit higher than some of the other stuff. Like, for example, we're just now getting back up on Amazon UK to start being able that will also serve as UK fulfillment because we have a lot of people, a lot of customers who they just buy bigger orders and they they eat the customs fees over in the UK and in in Europe. And so by getting up on Amazon UK, we're going to be able to better serve a lot of people, even though maybe it's a smaller percentage of our total customers, but we have a lot of customers. And so there's just stuff like that where I'm like, shit, I want... I want, I want to get that done before I go off and do these other things. And yeah, we'll yeah. get there. We'll get there. Yeah. The RTDs that, I mean, there's a, there's a big calling for them just because, you know, they're so convenient, as you know, yep. just on the go, you grab one. Great, great for traveling. Yeah. It doesn't take long to make a shake, but those RTDs, they're, they're great on the go. So yep. have you tried skier? I haven't even heard of that. Huh. So that's, Ic- is it an RTD? Is no, it a brand? Or? No, no. Going back to yogurt. So it's Icelandic. Oh yeah. 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 S S K Y R. Yeah. 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 They're good. Yeah. 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 For, for what it's worth for people listening, I prefer skier. I don't eat too much of it just because I don't really have it in my meal plan right now for no particular reason. But if I do want to have something like that, I prefer skier over Greek yogurt for what it's worth. At least most of the brands that I've tried of both, um, Icelandic provisions skier. Not that I, I'm not getting paid to say that, but uh, I, I like theirs in particular. There's probably better out there, but I've tried a few and then really like theirs and just stopped trying other ones. And so, anyway, for people who are eating Greek yogurt and if you've done a lot of things with Greek yogurt and you're not really excited about Greek yogurt anymore, you might like skier because it's a little bit different. It's a little bit creamier. Has a, I think a a different kind of base flavor i find that greek yogurt in general is a little bit more acidic it's just a, or bitter yeah it has like that little like tanginess bite to it yeah yep whereas skier has a little bit less so for whatever that's worth now do you know the macros in comparison to like a traditional about the, average greek yogurt same about the same yeah okay. i mean you can you can get the fattier tastier skier if you want or you can get um the the, the stuff that is a bit more just like i would say oh i don't know like a two percent greek yogurt so you know fair amount of protein uh pretty low in carbs and fat. flavor so those are always going to be tasty yeah so you can just decide for yourself what you want to do but what about like vegetables what about ways to make vegetables more enjoyable easier to eat butter that's a good tip in my experience i've i've realized that people think that you know, you, for whatever reason, you decide that, hey, I, I want to lose some weight. I'm going to start eating healthier, right? So they instantly switch into this all or nothing mentality. Like, I have to eat healthy, no more butter, no more saturated fat, no more this, no more that. And so they just become miserable trying to eat just plain veggies, no seasoning, no flavor, when in actuality, that's it's unnecessary. You know, again, it goes back to adherence. Like if putting a teaspoon of butter on your green beans makes it more enjoyable and makes you actually want to eat them, then go for it. You know, as long as it fits into your macros, your calories and your goals. 
But um, I, I really like uh, veggies in the air fryer. Crispy veggies are always, you know, tastier. What are your What are your favorites uh, in the air fryer? Um, I really like broccoli. It's kind of plain and boring, but um, a little bit of Parmesan cheese tossed in some olive oil or butter, a little bit of salt and pepper. And you can either do it in the air fryer or even in the oven on a sheet pan. Hit them uh, with a broil at the end and they come out a little charred and crispy and they're so good. I, I can just eat those like chips. Yeah. Yeah. I really like um, Brussels sprouts as well. Yeah. Prepared yep. like that can be really yeah. good. And there's also a misconception that you have to eat you know, organic, you have to eat fresh. Um, a lot of people don't realize that frozen veggies are just as nutritious, sometimes even more nutritious than fresh veggies. You know, they're frozen at the peak of freshness. So they say, um, so yep. all those nutrients are, are trapped in there. Their freshness is trapped in there. They might not be as crispy. So it really depends on how you're preparing them, or what kind of dish you're putting them in. Yep. But, um, you know, frozen veggies, even canned veggies, um, you know, they might have a little more sodium, stuff like that. So if you need to watch, watch your sodium content, then you know, be aware of that, but there's nothing wrong with canned veggies. There's nothing wrong with frozen, frozen veggies. Yeah. Yeah. I eat a, a fair amount. Like it's kind of a half, half mix of frozen and fresh simply because frozen is fast and easy and yeah, you know, chopping a whole bunch of fresh stuff there, there is a difference in, in the meal, but not that big of a difference, not enough for me to care. I still enjoy it the same. So, and actually our, as a nation, our biggest food waste comes from the home. And a lot of people, what they do is they go out with the intention of eating these veggies. They buy fresh because they think that's better. They get it home and they just never get around to eating them or preparing them and they toss them out. Food waste is a, is a big issue in the United States. Yeah, yeah. They'll open the fridge and then think, I wish I, I could be the person I believed I was when I bought all of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go order a pizza. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> Any other veggie tips? Like I remember one that was kind of funny uh, that somebody shared. He really doesn't like vegetables, but he understands the importance of eating them. And so to get in a serving of uh, leafy green serving or two, he would just he just get spinach and just eat it raw and just like whatever, dude, and just eat, just eat. <laughs> two big handfuls raw and just drink water and get it down and move on with his day. <laughs> like, I mean, if you like can choke it down do it. like that, then yeah, <laughs> for sure. A lot of people don't realize that you can, you can blend veggies too. throw them in your, in your shakes, smoothies, uh, make like a pasta sauce. Um, you're still getting all of those nutrients as long as you're not, um, uh, actually like juicing and removing any of the, you know, fiber constituents. Um, you're still getting all of those health benefits from eating your veggies. Yeah. Yeah. What, what about soups? Do you do any soups? Um, I do. I do soups um, usually around like fall, winter time, uh, you know, more soup season. But yeah, I, I love soup. It's an easy way to, um, you know, throw veggies in there. And going back to spinach, I found that chopping spinach really fine and throwing it in pretty much any dish, the flavor is so masked that you, you don't even flavor, you don't even taste it. And you're still getting all of the, you know, the benefits of eating the spinach. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, um, pasta. That's a, a great, yeah. like if you have a, you, if, you, if you just start with a good, let's say tomato sauce base, something you like, you can put all kinds of stuff in there without spoiling the dish at all. Let's talk about costs. Do you have any, do you have any advice for people who are, um, maybe on a tighter budget for, for their food and they do need to, to keep costs down. Um, yeah. So I am a big Walmart shopper. Um, I know that, you know, there's a lot of controversy because, you know, they're a big conglomerate and, you know, they put small businesses out of, you know, business and stuff. But as far as costs, like there's not a whole lot of people that will be Walmart's basic cost, uh, you know, across the field. I really like Aldi. They have a lot of deals on like cheese and stuff like that. There's a lot of coupon apps out there nowadays. Um, I use one called Ibotta and basically you download it, um, link it to your bank account. You look for deals that they might have. Sometimes they have BOGO. Sometimes they have, you know, X number of dollars back. If you buy this, you scan your receipt and you actually get that money back. Uh, I'm in Florida. So we have Publix here. Um, Publix has a lot of uh, BOGO deals and it, they change like every week. So uh, taking advantage of BOGO, getting a, a Sam's Club or a Costco membership can really be beneficial if you can afford to do bulk shopping. So if you can buy like the non-perishables in bulk, um, throw them in the pantry, the freezer, whatever you need to do, um, the bigger bulk items you get, obviously the cost is going to go down. 
Um, so you save money in the long run, even though you are paying more money up front. Do you, um, if you're, if you're looking to minimize your food expenses, are, are you staying away from generally prepackaged stuff and looking for stuff that you're going to be preparing yourself? Um, uh, I would say I kind of use a combination of both. Um, it really just, I, I really do look at like the, uh, the price per ounce price per pound. Um, a lot of grocery stores, I know Walmart does it, some others do it, but they actually have next to the actual cost of the item, they'll have a, you know, 39 cents per ounce. And you can compare that to different brands. Typically, obviously the Walmart brand is going to, you know, usually going to be the cheapest, um, unless there's some deal going on. But, um, I like to do a combination of, um, you know, fresh and prepackaged. Um, it really just depends on the dish. With my audience and my followers, I really try to appeal to the affordable side, but also the uh, the time management side. So I realize that you know I have a lot of single parents that follow me, uh, people that are working two, three jobs, and they're just on a, a time budget. And so a lot of times, using a, a prepackaged pasta sauce versus making your own from blending a bunch of veggies and tomatoes together, it might be cheaper to do, you know, your own, but at what cost, you know, versus the time taken. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk more about that in a second. Just one other question on the, on the cost side of things. Uh, people will, will often ask me about protein in particular, how, how to make protein a little bit more affordable. Uh, chicken, chicken and eggs, you know, they're, they're king when it comes to uh, lean protein. Uh, they're very versatile. You can put them in pretty much everything. Uh, the price of chicken has gone up lately. Um, I know in Florida, uh, it was a few months ago, $1.99 a pound. It's gone up to $2.99 a pound now. Um, and that's at Walmart. Um, I think Target and Aldi, they were all $1.99 a pound. They've gone up too. But yeah, chicken, um, again, if you buy the bigger package, don't be afraid to take out the portion that you know you're going to eat soon and freeze the rest of it. The bigger the package, obviously the lower the cost is going to be in, in the long run. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Just buy larger amounts and then kind of portion out what I need for the next few days, freeze the rest. Uh, let's not, let's talk about this point of um, saving time, how to, how to spend less time meal prepping, because that is a big obstacle. Money is an obstacle. And then the time that it, that it can take if you go about it certain ways. Right. Right. So me personally, I, before I started doing recipes for TikTok and stuff like that, I would typically meal prep twice a week. Uh, I would prep six meals on Sunday and then six meals on Wednesday. So that would be three from uh, three for me and three for my wife. That would get us through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then again, at the end of the week, and then Sunday was kind of a free day. A lot of people have this misconception that meal prep takes too much time. And all you really need is one day or a chunk of a day dedicated to meal prepping and you save so much more time throughout the week because if you think about it you're going to have to eat throughout the week so it's a lot less cleanup because you're not doing dishes every single day cooking every single day so in the long run i think it, it, it's great for time management i really like crock pot meals so the crock pot is something you throw everything in there put the lid on turn it on and you can walk away for two, three, four hours and come back and, you know, portion it out and you're done. What are some of your favorite crock pot recipes? I just did a uh, green enchilada pasta that turned out really good. Um, so I like the way that, that chicken cooks in the crock pot and you shred it. Um, you can do a lot with shredded chicken, uh, really versatile. But I mean, there, there's a lot of crockpot dishes I really like. I mean, there are so many recipes out there for anybody listening. Like if you haven't done crockpot cooking, poke around online, you can find a billion different recipes. Yeah. And nowadays I don't have one, but a lot of my followers, what they do is um, they'll take my crockpot recipes and they'll convert the time over to the instant pot. So the instant pot is like the crockpot, I guess, but it's a lot, it cooks a lot faster. So that's even better for time management. If you don't want to come back in, you know, two, three, four hours and check the crock pot, the Instant Pot might be a good investment. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's a, also coming back to vegetables that can make eating vegetables easy too because you throw everything in there, it cooks all together. If you have a good recipe, it tastes good. Just makes it easy. Hey there! If you are hearing this, you are still listening. 
which is awesome. Thank you. And if you are enjoying this podcast or if you just like my podcast in general and you are getting at least something out of it, would you mind sharing it with a friend or a loved one or a not so loved one even who might want to learn something new? Word of mouth helps really bigly in growing the show. So if you think of someone who might like this episode or another one, please do tell them about it. What about um, kind of fitness friendly desserts, indulgences, or some ways to uh, satisfy kind of a sweet tooth or make uh, dessert type foods a little bit lower calorie, uh, maybe sometimes even higher protein? So the food industry, it's kind of a double edged sword. They, they appeal to our fears and our wants, um, kind of, you know, it, they're, it's the good and the bad. The good thing is that they know there is a calling for people that want to eat sweets and snacks and desserts, but don't want all the calories that come with it. So there's a lot of different brands that are coming out nowadays. Uh, I really like uh, the Yasso Greek yogurt bars. I don't know if you ever had those. Those are really good. I get them for my kids. Well, they, uh, they really like them. They're coming out with new flavors every day. I know a lot of people like the Halo Top ice cream. Uh, Fairlife just came out with an ice cream. So there's a lot of different brands. You know, it really just comes down to, and I only recommend this to people who know for a fact that it's actually going to satisfy that craving. Because what I see as a registered dietitian with a lot of people is they'll go and opt for the lower calorie snack. It won't actually satisfy that craving. And then they turn around and eat the full calorie, full fat snack after that. That's why I stopped eating the low calorie ice creams. I didn't like them enough. So I was, I was doing them here and there. And then I hadn't had regular ice cream again in a while. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to try, I'm going to try with Jenny's. I'm going to try some Jenny's. And I was like, oh my God, I forgot what ice cream is supposed what to taste like. What have I been like. doing with my life? <laughs> exactly. And that was the end of low calorie ice cream for me. It's just not yeah. worth it. Like I find personally, I find you take, you give me those calories. I don't even need as many calories, but you give me a couple hundred calories, let's say. And if I eat um, a couple hundred calories of like dark chocolate, I find that very satisfying. But a couple hundred calories of Halo Top, by the third bite, I'm kind of like, eh, why am I eating this? And I'm, you know. Yeah. So for me, my favorite cookie is a chocolate chip cookie. I honestly don't think, and this this may suck to hear as if any of my followers that might hear it, I don't think I'll ever do a low calorie chocolate chip cookie. I was going to say, the only way to, you, you need all the butter, you need all the sugar. Yeah, I, I would never do that to my favorite dessert just because I know it would never do it justice. So it really just comes down to, making those snacks fit into your goals. And a lot of people just don't understand what moderation is. And again, what I've what I've seen as a registered dietitian is you almost need to create this abundance mindset. So a lot of people, they, when dieting and trying to lose weight, they shift to this scarcity mindset to where they absolutely cut out chocolate chip cookies, for instance. And the first time they get their hands on, like you said, it might be two, three months down the road, they get their hands on those chocolate chip cookies and they just go nuts with it. They just binge on an entire box or package. As opposed to if you allow yourself to have one or two every single day or every other day, you're creating that abundance mindset to where you tell yourself, I know I'm going to have this again tomorrow. I don't need to eat the whole package. As opposed to, oh man, I haven't had these in so long. I don't know the next time I'm going to have these. I need to just destroy this package right now. Yeah. 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 I, I, that's uh, that's a good point. Uh, it's something that I guess I, I haven't consciously kind of cultivated, but my birthday was a few days ago and we had a cake and it was super good. And it was just that point of just kind of pacing myself like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to eat as much of this cake as I want until I'm satisfied, but then I'll just stop there because I know I'll just eat more tomorrow and maybe then it'll be gone with everybody else, but that's fine. Any other, just uh, for yourself or people that you work with, um, kind of good sweet tooth or kind of craving eliminators without having to eat the whole box or package? What I really advocate for is enjoying whatever it is in moderation. Um, it, because a lot of people with dieting, they don't realize that the restrict binge cycle is a very real thing and it's a very real problem in our society especially with you know the weight loss industry they shift into this all or nothing mindset to where they absolutely cannot have these foods 
They finally get their hands on them. They binge. They feel defeated. They feel like a failure. They give up. They have that bounce back weight gain. They undo all of the progress that they made. And now they're even heavier than they were when they started. Which is even more demotivating. Right, exactly. And that that's part of the whole yo-yo dieting. And it's really frustrating as a dietitian to see so much misinformation on social media demonizing so many foods and just really creates this disordered eating environment for people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, something I'll just add to that. Just for example, for me personally, I don't keep ice cream simply because it's not a go-to for me because a couple hundred calories of good ice cream just isn't very satisfying for me. Like if I can't eat at least half of the pint, I'm just not very, you know, to do a few spoons moderation, it just doesn't do it for me. I would rather take those calories and again, give them over to some chocolate or maybe have a, I don't have too much random stuff, but like a muffin would be more satisfying to me personally. And so, you know, I think it's just good advice for people to find That's actually what works a good for point though, because a, a lot of people, you can't just jump straight into, oh, everything in moderation. There are people who literally can't have these foods in their pantry because they they can't practice moderation, at, at least not yet. And so maybe if you love chocolate chip cookies, instead of buying a whole package of Chips Ahoy, maybe try, you know, the, the single sleeve package or I know in the Walmart bakery they sell, you know, single cookies. You know, just if you don't have it in your house, you can't binge on it. So just incorporating these things into um, your lifestyle and your eating habits however you can. Um, and I always recommend if something is a multiple serving package, as soon as you get home, open it up, divide it out into either Ziploc bags or some sort of package into the actual serving size that you want. That way, every time you go to grab one, you know, you're getting three cookies is the serving size. I'll have it. I'll enjoy it. I'll move on. Yeah. That's a great tip because, uh, for most people, including probably you, me, just about everybody, if let's say it's cookies, and then we're going to sit down, especially let's say it's after dinner, we're now sitting down in front of the TV and we're, sp we're supposed to have three that's in our plan, but we have the whole box in front of us. I mean, you have a snack accident. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're not going to eat the whole thing, but on average, our intake is probably going to be uh, higher than three. But oh, if, yeah, if you sure. if you portion it out and then you have your little portion, it reminds me of, I think it was research that might have been later retracted. I know there was controversy, Brian Wansick, I believe, over there was research that suggested that even the size of the bowls and plates that we use when we eat can influence our eating habits, how much we eat. And again, I know that some of the research that this guy was doing did end up getting retracted and there was some controversy and i don't remember if the if the plate size bowl size was one of them but regardless this is a similar effect that we don't need we don't need research like we've all experienced that one i've seen some that um yeah i don't know if it was the same research but it comes down to i actually did a video on this um that i know my generation was raised on a eat everything on your plate or you're not getting up from the table mindset it really pushes us out of that intuitive eating just stance that we have towards food. If you give food to a, a two-year-old, they're going to eat until they're satisfied. They're going to get up and walk away. It doesn't matter how much is left on the plate. So a lot of times as adults, we eat with our eyes. We feel like we have to finish it because we're at a restaurant and we paid for it. And, you know, if we don't eat it, it somehow goes to waste. Or we took a big bowl and loaded it up, even if it's at home, and now we feel like we're wasting if we don't finish right. it. Right, yep. Or if you have kids, how many times? I don't know if you have kids, but do you have kids? No, I've got nieces and nephews. Okay. And, yeah, well, if you've been I, around, I think I know where you're going. You know, there's always yep. stuff left on plates, and you're like, oh, I'll try it. Oh, I'll give it to that. <laughs> oh, he didn't eat all his chicken nuggets. Yeah, exactly. What's, what's yeah. another couple chicken nuggets? But yeah, that's that's a good point. You know, that's something I keep in mind with my kids. And it's been a little bit of a balancing act because when my son was younger, he was, he was pretty skinny. I mean, not like grotesquely skinny, but he just didn't have that much of an appetite. And so my wife and I were always trying to encourage him to just eat a little bit more. Uh, we weren't trying to force him to finish his everything we always give him. But, you know, when he would say that he's done we would try to encourage him to maybe take another bite or two at least. And, and now he, we don't have that issue and he's exactly what you're talking about. He just eats and sometimes he's more hungry. Sometimes he's less hungry. So he's uh, nine now and my daughter's four and she is, I would say she just looks normal. She's not overweight, underweight, but she will tend to leave a lot of food 
And so it's the same kind of thing where we're like encouraging her to always at least take another bite or two. Yeah. Because yeah. she'll say she's full, but have not really eaten that much, you know. So we try it's we try not to create that situation though, where you know, we want to encourage them to eat well, but not create this kind of enforced you know, which might come turn into some weird subconscious like compulsion to always eat everything, you know. Yeah, I think they call it the clean your plate club. So oh uh, funny. One of the guys who works with me, he had an issue with that. Actually, he was quite overweight as a kid and his mom was very, she would, she would feed him a lot of food and always want him to eat all of it. And on top of that would let him eat whatever kind of junk food he wants to eat. And so he was, he got pretty, pretty big as a young kid and then, uh, lost a lot of the weight playing sports as a kid, but, um, then as an adult had to kind of rewire his relationship with food consciously because it, it did mess with him where he just ate in in such an unhealthy way as a kid for so long that it was hard for him to change that yeah a lot of people don't realize how much mindset uh plays into you know our relationship with food obesity dieting all of those things yeah. Can, can you actually talk? I, I know it's a little bit off topic, but I think it's kind of interesting um, how the, the, there are psychological factors that are in play, right? There are environmental factors that are in play, cultural factors in, that are in play. And, you know, I'm not for making excuses for people because I think you go too far in that direction and it actually becomes unproductive. But I have commented myself just that for people to understand that, um, so there are people who are struggling with their relationship with food in some in many cases it's not as simple as others might think it's not as simple as it necessarily has been for maybe you or me right yeah um i i'm a big advocate for uh therapy um i know there's a lot of um not necessarily if you have an eating disorder but even disordered eating uh, there's a lot of good therapists out there that can work on kind of uh, digging and finding where those root causes and root beliefs come from. Uh, a lot of it stems from uh, childhood. Um, it can come from watching too much social media and just listening to unqualified individuals just demonize food. And it gets to a point where people think that, I mean, there's something that's bad, according to, you know, somebody out there whether it's the water we drink, the air we breathe, fruits, vegetables, there's always somebody that will demonize something. And 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 somebody who is credentialed as well should probably add that, right? Because often this is just human nature, right? When we don't know how to determine the truth of a statement, we default to the person making the statement and often just default to credentials like, oh, they're a doctor. They're a New York Times bestselling author. They're, you know, they have a bunch of uh, fancy titles after their, their name. I don't, who am I to say that they're wrong? Yeah. Appeal to credentials is a, is another big problem. I won't drop any names, but there's a lot of doctors out there that, you know, just really use that doctor title to, you know, promote their best selling book about, you know, don't eat this food. This is the reason America is obese. And um, it's it's really just an agenda, not a lot of merit to it. It's 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 hard to say don't listen to anything on social media because there's there's also good information out there. But I mean, it's it's really hard to deduce who to listen to and who not to listen to. Like you said, you know, doctors are, you know, spreading these things and you have other doctors that say, oh, don't listen to that doctor. Listen to me. Um, you know, so at, at what point, how do you figure out um, who to believe? You know, that could be a whole podcast and discussion unto, yeah, unto itself. Sure. But I would say, you know, one example of, um, of, of, a, of a red flag is um, splashy contrarian marketing, like, you know, uh, very noisy and saying things that are outlandish even, or that go against kind of some mainstream idea like eating vegetables is good. You know, oh, well, you have some some massive juice head guy decide, you know, he's on Instagram eating uh raw bull testicles and he he said he said eating vegetables is bad. You know, it, it sounds silly, but unfortunately what you'll find is 
a lot of the better marketing is in the dishonest camp. And, and some of that is, is just because like, for example, contrarian statements get attention and a lot of marketing, I mean, it it begins with getting people to say, yes, I will pay attention. Right. Um, but, but I would just say, uh, that if you look at it in terms of marketing skill, you have a lot more skilled marketers out there just selling nonsense because you have a lot of people who they're good at marketing and they don't really care about anything else. Whereas you have a lot of experts who are trying to tell people about the boring basics really. And it's much harder to make those sexy because many people are, uh, they're drawn to the marketing, they're drawn to the sizzle, they're drawn to brands, like where it becomes a whole ideology. It's not just kind of dry, you know, make sure your energy balance is supporting your goals and make sure you eat enough right, protein. Yeah, it's like, so boring. Oh, boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to just um, self-accountability and taking responsibility. So nobody wants to hear that, man, I'm obese because of X, Y, and Z decisions that I made. You know, obviously there's other factors that go into obesity, but a lot of it comes from just overeating I mean, in the end, that's what it is. I mean, we know of why they're doing it. I mean, that's it, that's where it starts to get more complicated. But right, but everybody wants to hear that. Oh man, it's not because of the choices I made in my life. It's because the government has been spiking my foods with these preservatives that made me obese. It's because you know this person lied, and you know this new research came out, and this is why I'm obese. It it really comes down to just almost an unwillingness to take accountability and responsibility for your, your own decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. There is, um, I'm, I'm trying to find it here. I came across uh, a clever little quote. Uh, it was, it was along the lines of like one line persuasion. Let me find it here. Okay. So here it is. People will do anything for those who encourage their dreams, justify their failures, allay their fears, confirm their suspicions and help them throw rocks at their enemies. And, uh, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think that's, yeah, that, yeah. that's a, a good, a good summary actually of a lot of this misleading kind of marketing that we see in our space. It's usually, it's usually checking several or all of those boxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a form of confirmation bias, you know? Yep. Yep. And I guess that's, that's kind of a phase maybe that people need to go through and that's fine. Um, it's just, uh, you know, people like us are out there saying, Hey, when you're, when you're ready to, to kind of level up, um, we're here, we're here. And, uh, maybe, maybe at one point, the idea that actually the problem is eating too much and moving too little. Well, that was not palatable. And then you have to go through some of this other stuff until you then go, all right, none of that worked. Maybe Zach was right. Or maybe Mike was right. Maybe I am just eating too much food and not moving enough. Maybe I'll try that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but coming back to meal planning, um, are there any other just kind of general tips or, or best practices that we haven't covered that you want to share? It's okay to start small. Uh, I've, I've talked to and interacted with a lot of people who just think that meal prepping and meal planning is just, it's, it's too overwhelming. They think that they have to make 60 different meals on Sunday and that's all you can eat throughout the week. Um, even if you just prep, five breakfast meals for the week, Monday through Friday, prep your breakfast, see how you feel, see if it helps you, see if it aligns with your goals, your time management, your budget. Um, And even if you're not prepping full meals, my content is all prepping full meals, but you can prep portions of a meal as well or, or parts of a meal. So if you feel like you just really hate cooking your protein throughout the week, you can prep your chicken on Sunday and just make a side every day to go with it. So you can, you can prep, you know, just parts of a meal and just build that foundation throughout the week. Um, but don't be afraid to start small. You, again, it comes down to the all or nothing mentality. A lot of times when people start this fitness journey, oh, I'm going to go to the gym seven days a week. I'm going to eat nothing but whole grains and, you know, fruits and veggies, just start small. If you, if you have a, a if you just are drinking 10 Cokes a day, 
I would never tell somebody, cut out Coke, never drink it again. I would tell them, okay, let's try to cut down to eight Cokes a day. Once you are okay with eight Cokes a day, let's cut that down to six. Let's cut that. You know, it's all about baby steps and it, it's no different with meal prepping. If it's your first time and you're just trying it out, start with one meal, see how it feels and move up from there. Yeah, it's great advice. It's it's kind of the tiny habit approach, right? To use BJ Fogg's where start with something that just in your mind uh, produces no friction, so to speak, right? Where you're like, oh yeah, that, that's easy. No problem. I can do that. So, so just, just segueing off of that, then for people who let's say they're, they're not doing any meal prepping right now. Are there, are there places where you find that people tend to succeed best with, um, if they start there, like, like for example, um, maybe prepping a certain meal based on kind of their lifestyle. Like if one, if, if they just pick one meal and, and just starting with that, you mentioned breakfast is, but, but for some people, uh, maybe it could be another meal for another reason or. Yeah. So I always advocate for lunch, especially if you work in an office environment, you, you leave the house. If you leave the house and that's where you're going to be eating lunch at work, you know, whatever. A lot of times what happens is say you work in an office and you have a, a lunchroom there that serves lunch. If they're serving the same thing and you absolutely hate the, the food there, you might have friends that come over. Hey, we're going to such and such pub to grab some lunch. A lot of times those restaurant meals are not going to be conducive with your goals. You know, a big problem in, in America is uh, restaurant portion sizes are almost double a normal portion size. And restaurant food is probably on average double the calories of how you would make it at home. <laughs> exactly. So if you can make something that you look forward to eating for lunch, Prep that meal, take it to work, let your friends know, hey, not this time, guys. I have this, you know, awesome pasta recipe that's waiting for me in the fridge. So, yeah, that's great advice. And um, people who also are on the road a lot can like if it's throughout the day. Right. And then just to help prevent them from hitting the drive through. Really. Right. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Drive throughs they're they're very enticing. They're easy. They're cheap. You know, but if you know you have that that meal waiting for you. You're not to say that you won't go to the drive through, but you're less likely. Yeah. Last question regarding fast food. What are your thoughts on fast food and um, staying fit, let's say, or getting fit? Um, I think it, it can still fit into your your daily diet. I actually just posted a video um, yesterday, actually. Um, and under, I had two boxes and on the front of the boxes, I had the, the calories listed. One was 700 and one was 730. Um, I asked my followers to pick which one they would choose for weight loss. I assume people would choose the 700. So under the 730 box, um, was a Chick-fil-A grilled chicken salad. Um, it was an avocado lime ranch dressing, which was probably about half the calories, but it just goes to show that. You know, just because it's a salad doesn't mean it can't be high calorie. And then under the other box was a McDonald's cheeseburger, a small fry and a four piece nugget. So a lot of people, when they think eating healthy weight loss, oh, I can't have McDonald's. That's too high calorie. When in fact, if you pick and choose foods that fit into your goals, your taste preference, your your budget, you can absolutely make it work. Out of curiosity, just in your experience working with people, um, have you seen maybe just what common like patterns of, uh, well, here's what tends to work well. Here's what pe where, where people who do want to be eating fast food. Um, here's how they tend to incorporate it. Here's like the stuff they tend to stay away from these things and kind of gravitate towards these things or no? Um, kind of. Um, it really comes down to, um, a lot of people, what they do when they go to a fast food restaurant, they think, um, I, I notice this a lot with uh, males. Um, they tend to go to McDonald's, for example, and, you know, hey, I'm a big guy. I need a large fry. I need two double cheeseburgers and, you know, a large Coke. Um, there are some changes that you can make. You can do a diet Coke, zero calories. You can do a smaller or medium fry. You can do, you know, a single patty. Just it really comes down to kind of reducing that portion size. Um, and as long as it's not over re overly restrictive for you and you feel like it's still going to fill you up and satisfy you, 
uh, to the point where you're not going to turn around and, and binge later. It really just comes down to kind of reducing that portion size to something that's more appropriate and conducive with your goals. Yeah, that makes sense. Similar to what what you were saying with um, with sweets and dessert type foods is finding something that really does satisfy you for a reasonable amount of calories. Right. Exactly. Cool, cool. Well, this has been uh, this has been great. This has been very informative. Again, I, I appreciate you taking the time to do it. And why don't we wrap up with uh, where people can find you and find your work and if there's anything in particular you want them to know about? OK, uh, yeah, I'm on uh, TikTok and Instagram mostly. Um, I just started YouTube. It's uh, at Zach Cohen, uh, Z-A-C-H-C-O-E-N on all platforms. Uh, I do have a Patreon. Uh, it's five dollars a month. Um, I do a lot of uh, additional recipes, kind of. Uh, I do uh, monthly meal plans just to give people an example of how they can incorporate my recipes into their goals. That's basically the only places I'm I'm at right now. I don't do any like any one on one coaching right now. I'm really focusing on just content creation to help the masses. Cool. So. cool. Well, um, thanks again for for doing this, and thanks for supporting Legion as well. I really appreciate it. And, yeah. um, we'll have to, we'll have to see if we can brainstorm another one sometime. All right. Sounds good. Thanks yeah. so much, Mike. Well, I hope you liked this episode. I hope you found it helpful. And if you did subscribe to the show because it makes sure that you don't miss new episodes. And it also helps me because it increases the rankings of the show a little bit, which of course then makes it a little bit more easily found by other people who may like it just as much as you. And if you didn't like something about this episode or about the show in general, or if you have uh, ideas or suggestions or just feedback to share, shoot me an email, mike at muscleforlife.com, muscleforlife.com, and let me know what I could do better or just uh, what your thoughts are about maybe what you'd like to see me do in the future. I read everything myself. I'm always looking for new ideas and constructive feedback. So thanks again for listening to this episode, and I hope to hear from you soon.